narrative podcast is changing the narrative one episode at a time. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of the Narrative Podcast. The Narrative Podcast is the original pe- or is a home for original people peace, original people reciprocity, and original people culture. And I am your host, Hall C. Allen. Welcome to the Narrative Podcast. Welcome all my narrators. Um, so we've got a good show for you today. Um, my narrators, there are no demonstration. There are no with the... Uh, narrative podcast is all about and all what I'll be covering, what type of content I'll be covering this evening. Um, But for those that don't, new listeners, I give you a brief overview before diving into the content this evening. Uh, But first, we've got a few things that um, need acknowledgement before uh, getting into the synopsis of the narrative podcast. So like I said, um, before diving into the content this evening, um, I want to acknowledge a couple people who we have recently um, lost. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge the um, career and life of a brother that passed away um, on the uh, 24th, and that is uh, Flint, uh, Flint Council Member Eric Mays. He passed away on February 24th. And I'll be talking a little bit about him, spoiler alert, later on in the, uh, you know, for my content this evening. Um, and then also want to acknowledge the passing of a brother that just passed yesterday in the world of um, sports entertainment, uh, Virgil Jones, or just um, in the wrestling world, professional wrestling world known as Virgil, I was a huge, um, you know, wrestling fan in my childhood. Um, So, you know, wrestling on Saturdays, like right after the cartoons was a whole thing. so he was, uh, his persona, his wrestling persona was just Virgil. Uh, for many years, he was the, uh, you know, in the world of wrestling, uh, bodyguard to uh, Ted DiBiase, the uh, million dollar man. But, um, you know, he passed um, tragically. Uh, no real news. I haven't seen any news about, you know, the cause of uh, his untimely passing, but um, from what little sources I I have come across said, um, you know, he passed away of natural causes. I haven't heard, uh, <coughs> ran across anything concrete, though, but, you know, he definitely will be missed and appreciated for his contributions being one of the um, architects for uh, our people in the world of professional wrestling. So we'll give uh, both brothers, Mr. Mays and um, Mr. Jones, a moment of silence before diving into the content here on the uh, Narrative Podcast. All right, West Rail Brothers, um, deepest condolences. I'm projecting love, light, healing energy to the families of Mr. Mays and Mr. Jones. All right, so some things you should know about the uh, narrative podcast before diving into the content this evening. Let's start at the top, Tippy, the name. I named my podcast the Narrative Podcast because I don't like the false narrative that the uh, media weaves about original people and original people culture. Um, You know, I don't like the way our people are portrayed in the media. Um, The media intentionally uh, misrepresents our people. Um, 
intentionally portrays us in a negative light. Uh, so what I want to do, do is design a platform to, you know, counter that by um, building a platform where I'm highlighting our successes, celebrating our accomplishments, and, um, you know, playing up all our strengths and um, focusing the lens on our people and our culture through a, a positive light. So, you know, that's what the narrative podcast is essentially about. Uh, my mission statement is to basically bring awareness to the listening audience of why it's so important to share positive content about our people and our culture. And I encourage my listeners to, you know, responsibly use, utilize their platforms to share positive um, frames of reference about our people and our culture and I think that's a perfect segue for my tagline the narrative podcast changing the narrative one episode at a time by destroying negative stereotypes about our people about original people and original people culture how do I destroy the negative stereotypes about our people and our our culture by providing positive frames of reference about our people and our culture hence the uh, title the narrative podcast. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's basically you know what the narrative podcast is about in a nutshell. Because um, like I said, the media is you know intentionally trying to warp the perception of the uh, minds of the masses. Um, they're intentionally trying to warp our own, you know, self-perception of how we perceive ourselves by, you know, the way they uh, propagate negative stereotypes and uh, stigmas within our culture, about our, within our culture and about our people. Uh, you know, it's not entirely their fault. You know, they're primarily doing it for the uh, dollar, of course. But um, also because the media is ran by the powers that be. Powers that be have a, a horrible, wicked agenda. And who are the powers that be? The elite class, higher echelon, uh, wealthy, powerful people, um, AKA wealthy white people. So they basically um, control the media because they want to uh, they want to have the uh, image of being all powerful of being uh, pristine of being uh, prestigious of being uh, regal um, of being uh, sophisticated and refined and cultured and to maintain this false image is uh, to maintain that false image, what they tend to do is, um, you know, warp the uh, images of people around them. So anybody that's not in their tax bracket or anybody that doesn't have the resources they have, they try to, you know, use the media to um, basically make them appear degenerate and low class and unintelligent in contrast to them, in contrast to their class. And they do it to all people from all walks of life. Uh, but out of all the people they do it to, they do it to our people the most. And they do it to our people the most because they fear our people the most. Um, they know their history and they know our history. They know how they acquired their uh, wealth, their financial wealth, all their resources, all their land, all their um, assets. And then they know, you know, our past and our uh, true history and origin, you know, and they know they got everything essentially from us and without us, it could be no them. And their biggest fear is, you know, 
we would start like acting like that as a people, being aware of our uh, rich past and start um, networking with each other and um, pooling our resources and you know building our own institutions and uh, slowly reclaiming everything that they took from us and you know basically they're afraid of being left in the cold they don't want to share their power they don't want their power usurped um, they don't want you know to wake up and realize they're not special anymore they don't get that five-star treatment anymore they don't want to share a gated community with us they don't want to um, you know be on equal footing with us in any capacity and their biggest biggest fear is that we would once we get our act together do to them what they've done and are currently doing to us and that's why they manipulate the media so bad but um, it's an ill-gotten fear because, you know, that's not who we are as a people. Uh, you know, we don't have a history of raping other cultures. We don't have a history of stealing from other cultures. We don't have a history of claiming things that wasn't ours, uh, saying we invented things that we didn't invent saying we discovered things that we did not discover. We don't have a history of theft and lying and um, taking resources by force. You know, we don't have a history of that. Our history is, you know, enlightenment, love, and education. Everywhere we existed on the planet, we progressed civilization. We enhanced um, civilization. We made it, you know, more enjoyable to live anywhere we roamed in original times. Um, whereas they, the higher echelon, the people who they descend from, everywhere they existed, they bought war, pestilence, famine, and death, and chaos. And they know that. Um, so yeah, but um, you know, wicked agenda aside, the media at the core of it, you know, at the end of the day, it's a supply and demand, it's a business, and the first rule of business is uh, supply and demand, which brings me to my next point, uh, the reason why I call my target listening audience, my narrators, um, is because we're living in the digital information age. Um, we utilize these digital platforms, these little uh, computers that we walk around in our, po with our, in our, in our pockets or, you know, wherever, you know, if you're a female, your purse, um, well, these days, if you're a guy, your purse, but Anyway, <laughs> um, you know, we just, point being, we got information at the touch of a button. That's how we share information. That's how we uh, learn about things and learn about people and make up our minds about um, how to engage and how to um, interpret, interact with people these days, you know. People judge you based on what you're posting online. And I'm going somewhere with that. Um, a lot of these Fortune 500 companies do it as well. The media is wearing, you know, it's, the media just is a Fortune 500 company. If you really want to keep it a thousand, America is a Fortune 500 company. And, you know, they create products based on these days, based on, you know, what people are posting online. They associate you as an individual about what you're posting online. 
what you're clicking on online, your ideals, your uh, value systems, your belief systems, uh, you know, your, your upbringing, your hobbies, your interests, you know, your faith, your religion, your uh, whatever is judged based on um, what you're posting online. And so these Fortune 500 companies, what they do is they monitor these trends and, you know, statistics, and they'll go create products based around, you know, their research. And their research stems from, you know, whatever you're posting online. And I swear I'm going somewhere with this. So back to why I call my um, target listening audience my narrators. Uh, we're living in the digital information age. Um, corporations uh, create product to accommodate, you know, whatever we're posting online. So in essence, you know, we can uh, tell or narrate our own stories. So you can create your own reality online. And this will open up a whole new world for you. You know, resources, because like, you know, that's how the computers work. Whatever you're posting it, it suggests certain fees, certain things to follow, certain things to buy. Now, when it comes to our people, this Fortune 500 company um, known as America, the product they're creating for us and they're pushing, keep pushing on us is degeneracy. Degeneracy is like a trillion dollar a year business and unfortunately, we as a people advance it and help it grow. And we are just symbiotically attached to it because we keep on participating in it by keep regurgitating these negative stereotypes and stigmas that the media placed over us. And they place these negative stereotypes and stigmas over us to create the product of degeneracy. That's what they want for us. And we keep on feeding into it. So every time you know, we're posting um, stories online about gang culture, pimp culture, whore culture, um, drug culture, on the dealing end of it and on the using end of it, um, we're furthering the cause. We're helping them to create more product, more degenerate product to um, sell to us, to mass produce and sell to us. That explains, you know, these horrible television shows, these horrible um, movies, these horrible uh, books and magazines depicting our uh, images and our likenesses in a negative way. But as a people, we can change the narrative by becoming narrators and posting positive content online. Um, while we can't control, you know, how the world sees us, how they perceive us, and how they react to us, we can control what we're posting online. And that's what I highly encourage all my listeners, all my listening audience is to control, you know, what you're posting online. Um, make your people, everybody in your circle, uh, make them the heroes. Celebrate the positive things instead of um, giving cadence and um, credence to the negative things in life. It's not the end all be all solution, but it is a solution. And that's why I call my target audience, my narrators, we have the ability to tell or narrate our own stories online now. Um, the next order of business for the narrative podcast before diving into the content this evening. Um, I refer to our people as original people. 
Um, the reason why I refer to our people as original people is because for two reasons, um, it's historically accurate and it unifies us as a people. And what do I mean by historically accurate? Um, we were the first people on this planet, this little thing called Earth, this dimension, this plane for the people, you know, believing like, you know, dimensions and planes, we was this realm or whatever you want to call it. We was here first. Um, and we existed on every single square inch of this planet originally. Um, our existence predates all, all laws, um, calendars, religious tract, tablets, scripts, um, scrolls. We was here before everything. And contrary to all unpopular belief, we've always, since our uh, existence on this planet, we've always been highly advanced, highly civilized. Um, we was never covered an excessive body here. We didn't um, evolve from monkeys. We wasn't living in caves, uh, using primitive uh, tools and weapons. Like I said, we've always been highly, you know, civilized. We've been always been highly advanced. We was the first people to be civilized and advanced. No, we didn't have no cranial overbite. We didn't have no um, hunched over sloping posture. We wasn't covered in excessive body here. We wasn't living in, dwelling in caves. That was another group of people, not us. Since our time here, all we've ever d done was, you know, build civilizations. We built, um, you know, statues and cities and citadels highly advanced structures, we, you know, we created everything. You know, the creation of everything can be traced to the original man and woman of this planet. And that's why I refer, one of the reasons why I refer um, to our people as original people. Um, and then the sidebar I want to tack on to that point, a sub point I want to make, um, a false narrative that, um, you know, the powers that be, these um, plunderers that call themselves historians, they inaccurately um, record out the um, beginning of our uh, existence you know, they inaccurately try to attach slavery to our people, meaning like they try to, you know, sell the, um, you know, the false, false, falsehood of us, our uh, existence, starting with slavery. Slavery was a very real part of our culture, it did happen, but you know, it's a lie about how long it happened and it's a lie about our involvement with it that they keep on, you know, spinning the false narrative about. But like I said, we was the original um, beings on this planet. We existed on every single corner of the globe before everybody and contrary to all unpopular belief, we didn't get to all these places on slave boats, especially here in the Americas, especially anywhere, you know, any Spanish speaking nation. It was already originally here. Most of us, the majority of us, some of us did come over on slave boats, but it was like less than 30%. Um, and it didn't just go on hundreds of years as they keep on trying to portray it. Like they just kept going back to the continent, kept getting this, kept getting this, kept getting this. That didn't happen. Um, 
we was already originally here in the Americas. We was already originally um, in Europe, in Germany, um, in in uh, you know Switzerland, Ireland, in Canada, um, in Australia, in the Pacific Islands. You know, in every single corner of the continent of Asia. Japan, Korea, China, Thailand, Laos. Mongolia, the Philippines, we was already there. Every single Spanish speaking nation, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Cuba, Argentina, we was already, like Spain, we was everywhere. DR, PR, we was already there. That's what I mean when I say, you know, historically accurate to uh, refer to our people as original. We was even in Russia, North Pole, South Pole, Alaska. We can survive them harsh, cold, climates due to a process called depigmentation. The second reason why I call, refer to our people as original people is because it unifies us as a people. Um, as, as I said, we was originally here every single you know corner of the globe. Um, we all speak different languages, believe in different deities, um, spiritual practices, religious practices, politics, um, spirituality, um, anything to divide a people, used to divide a people, divides us as a people. But, you know, the one thing that we all have in common, we all, you know, possess carbon, melanin, you know, the stuff the galaxy is made out of. We all possess a high concentration of that, and as long as we do, we can always um, trace our lineage back to the point of origin that that substance originated from, the original point, which was the original point of origin for all living beings on this planet. We all hail from that. We all can trace our lineage back to that. And that's why I refer to our people as original people here on the Narrative Podcast. If you're comfortable calling yourself black, you can go right on ahead, keep calling yourself black. I'm not telling you what not to do. Um, if you want to call yourself a Negro, go ahead and call yourself a Negro. I'm not telling you what not to do. I'm just telling you what I do. And I refer to our people as original people as often as possible here on the Narrative Podcast. <clears throat> um, next thing, um, this is a, a time-sensitive platform. I try not to exceed one hour per broadcast. Um, I like to try to keep my um, content fresh and innovative and, you know, keep my listening audience attentive to what I have to say and, you know, basically um, not bore you to sleep. I can't keep you interested and enthralled in the content if I'm, you know, you know, just droning on and on and on. So as a preventative measure of, to prevent me from rambling, I just, you know, decided not to um, have each episode exceed an hour. And that for the ones that have exceeded an hour, it's not by much. I've had quite a few episodes when I first started. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just talking and talking and talking and no, not, no real points, just really venting, just legit rambling. But, you know, I fine-tuned my, um, you know, podcast skills and, you know, figured out my niche, I guess what they call it, my niche, and, you know, figured out how to you know, keep the little listeners 
that I do have keep them coming back to listen to new episodes of the Narrative Podcast and you know this is basically I use the KISS formula keep it simple silly um, I don't want to you know dumb myself down but then I also don't want to be so advanced I'm shooting over people's heads I want to be there like right in the middle middle pocket just making the knowledge um, appliable uh, making it you know um, practical so everybody that listens to it can get something from it so that's my um, goal with the narrative podcast keep you entertained um, appeal to the masses um, you know keep you attentive and um, pique your interest pique your intellect intellect and um, you know pique your Peak your uh, focus and um, attention. <clears throat> Just try to um, appeal to all your senses, basically. Um, so yeah, that's why I ch- uh, keep you know my podcast so short and to the point. Um, I have two formats. I have a weekday format and I have a weekend format. During my weekday format, which is today, it used to be my lives, but this platform has done away with the live function. And no longer, there's no lo- no longer a live feature on this uh, podcast platform that I'm using to broadcast. So, you know, it's no longer a live. I would be live during the weekdays. But um, I will refer to them as super random lives because I don't know what days I'm going to have available during the weekday to upload. Um, On my weekends, there's a full broadcast of the narrative podcast. But during my weekdays, which is today, it's a different format. And basically, I share news articles and I deliver commentary on things um, happening uh, globally or, you know, nationally or things happening within our community that affects us so you know that's my weekday format um i got one more um section added to the weekday in lieu of uh this month black history month which today is the last day of it and then also happy leap day for those to celebrate leap year, I guess today's leap day. But um, anyway, yeah. And then on my um, on the weekends, it's you know, it's a little longer. I got a few more sections. Each section is divided. Each you know, my podcast is divided into sections, and um, all the sections have a, a time limit to speak on. And um, yeah, that's really it far as my format goes for the narrative podcast. Um, I think I covered everything you need to know, all the nuances. I think I walked you through everything. If I missed anything, I'm, um, you know, over 300 episodes in. You can refer to a previously recorded episode of the narrative podcast to, um, you know, bring you up to speed about what it is I do here. Um, So, you know, without any further ado, I'm gonna dive right on into the content this evening on this uh, great Thursday. And, you know, dive into my first section. And my first section is articles. So during my weekday uh, edition of the Narrative Podcast, um, the positive frame of references that I share with my listening audience are, you know, positive news articles that come across my feed. And the reason why I do that is because, like I said at the beginning of um, my synopsis, um, the media just um, intentionally bombards us with negativity um, it's, you know, an open, all-out attack on our psyches. It's psychological warfare. Um, they just want to keep on um, 
circulating and um, bombarding, us, bombarding us with negative news so that our uh, subconscious, um, you know, brain functions will accept that, that negativity as re reality and will start living and acting out that negativity. And unfortunately, it is kind of working. But like I said, um, I'm here to upset that balance. So to counter that, you know, I want to put out positivity in the atmosphere, and that's why I'm doing, you know, the positive articles, um, putting out positive frame, frames of reference about our people and our culture, um, types of frames of references I deliver here on the uh, narrative podcast and stories about entrepreneurship, leadership, um, you know, academic excellence, um, us uh, triumphing in the uh, stories about us triumphing in the uh, face of adversity, overcoming uh, difficult obstacles, um, and just being great, celebrating our greatness, and encouraging all my listeners to, you know, create an atmosphere where our greatness is celebrated and praised on a consistent basis. Whereas the media is just constantly, it's all negative. It's always, they're always depicting us from a um, negative angle. It's, you know, we're always going to jail. We're always fighting amongst each other um, and uh, engaging in some type of degenerate, lewd, crude act. But um, yeah, here on the Narrative Podcast, um, we celebrate our excellence and encourage the listener audience to celebrate and um, share our excellent moments where we're triumphant and we're victorious and we're progressive. So without any further ado, diving into the first section of the Narrative Podcast, um, motivational articles, and my first motivational uh, news article uh, on the weekday edition of the uh, Narrative Podcast, the headline reads, Young Black GavCon Strategist Helps 50,000 Small businesses secure six-figure government contracts. And um, a GovCon specialist is just how it, it's just short for a government contract. I had to look that up. I, I'm not familiar with that phrase any, either when I first read the article or the headline. Um, so the brother that's um, helping everybody is a brother by the name of Hamza uh, Sabri. I believe I'm pronouncing his name correctly. It's H-A-M-Z-A-S-A-B-R-E, -E, Hamza Sabri. Um, his Instagram handle is at global leader underscore and you know, um, his online course is at www.school, and school is spelled with a K, S K O O L, dot com forward slash global contacts. Um, he's also made an ebook called How to Win Your City. Um, so you can go there, click on that link. And you will notice um, free webinar, uh, you know, all the webinars he has available to teach you how to uh, secure these um, government contracts to build institutions, you know, which a lot of us should be doing. Um, there's all kinds of things just in the news lately, you know, telling us we need to build our own institutions. And what do I mean by our own institutions? Um, our own banks, our own financial sector, um, our own schools, you know, all grade levels, you know, from elementary to college 
you know, traditional four year or community colleges um, and vocational training skills facilities. Because if not, you know, well, we're already, you know, living in why we, why we need our own institutions. But, you know, for the brothers and sisters that's helping out, you know, that's already helping out, you know, this, this um, skill could, you know, help elevate you even further. So, like, I would say don't think of it as a government handout. Think of it as a form of reparations because, like, any type of government aid or, you know, subsidy or whatever should just automatically be ours anyway, the people that built this country. Because without us, there would be no America. But um, anyway, this is definitely a leg up. Um, this brother is um, a social media inf influencer. He does TED Talks, he does webinars. Um, he has his own podcast. He's a guest on, you know, pretty much everybody body that has a podcast that teaches about um, financial literacy. He's been a guest on there, so he knows what he's talking about. He he, he can uh, his program can teach you how to secure government contracts. If you would like to know more about how to secure these government contracts, um, hit up your brother Hamza Sabri at, you know, global leader underscore, that's his Instagram handle. And then check out his book, ebook, How to Win Your City. So start off super strong with that. Um, join me into uh, giving that brother Ham, I'm just gonna call him Ham, <laughs> a warm narrative podcast round of applause for uh, his global school. All right, on to the next article this evening on the Narrative Podcast. The headline reads, HBCB, H, excuse me, a little tongue tied. HBCU grad bought the TV station where she once worked as an intern. So she interned at this news station and ended up buying it. Um, the sister's name is April Ross, a former Alabama State University grad. Uh, she now owns WJ. CN 33 in LaGrange, Georgia, uh, where she once uh, interned during college. She bought the network on, in May of 21. It's currently being broadcast in 600,000 households across 11 different counties. Um, there's nothing I would share more, but you know, there was nothing more in the article. That one was a short one, and I didn't feel like, you know, researching it more thoroughly to see, you know, her evolutionary process. Like, how did she acquire the funds to uh, purchase the news network? But, you know, if you're feeling, you know, curious enough to do that, you can do your own Googles and do it. But you know, that's just how it came across my feed, and I um, shared it with you this evening the way it came across to me. So let's put our uh, hands together for our sister April Rocks at WJCN33 in LaGrange, Georgia. Moving right along, the next 
next article here on the Narrative Podcast, the headline reads, Man becomes first lawyer in his family after his teacher said he was a special ed student. And the brother's name is Ray Curtis Petty Jr. of Albany, Georgia. Um, So, growing up, nearly all of his teachers insisted he be placed in special needs class or special ed classes. Um, he went went on to his first degree at Albany State University. He then applied and got accepted to uh, Western Michigan State University. Thomas M. Cooley Law, uh, the Thomas M. Cooley Law School. Um, while there, he was uh, elected to be the class president of the State Bar Association. He also worked as a paralegal while studying. And then um, at some point, he joined, the, um, there was an opening for a, a paralegal in the Air Force, and he was the, um, a paralegal for the Air Force. Um, during his final semester of law school, he lost his um, oldest sister due to sickle cell anemia. Uh, despite all his obstacles and setbacks, he went on to graduate at the top of his class and w- was awarded the prestigious honor of Valor Victorian of his graduating class. So, without any further ado, let's give a warm narrative podcast round of applause for our brother Ray Curtis Petty Jr. and you know his rise to become a lawyer. Um, Just one thing I want to throw in there you know a little sidebar before going on to the next um, article. Um, As you see that's a prime another primary example of why we as a people need our own institutions because it's a common practice in the public schools to misdiagnose young original men and their young original women with some type of learning disability. They say they're learning disabled, um, say they have autism, say they have um, ADHD, when in just reality they don't want to teach them. And they're trying to um, fill a quota to get, you know, government grant money so the teachers can get a higher salary. So, you know, not saying that was the case. In his case, I don't know. You know, his academic struggles, I don't, I'm not aware of that. The article didn't disclose none of that. But, you know, this is, that's a big, you know, stumbling block for our people, these public school systems, how they do us. But, um, yeah, join me into uh, giving our brother Ray Curtis Pettis Jr. a warm narrative podcast round of applause. A lot of articles this evening. I think I have one, two. I think I have two more. But like, I think three more. I think. Yeah, I got a lot tonight. It was a, a week of excellence. Like they just kept on coming through my feed. Um, I follow a lot of uh, black stuff. So, yeah. Anytime I see a positive new art, news article, what I do is I just um, I do a screenshot and then um, make bulleted notes so I can share with my listening audience at a later date. But like I said, I never know what the later date will be because I never know my um, you know how my weekday is going to turn out.
But um, anyway, if you can, if you would like for me to upload on a more consistent basis, make sure you're participating in the content here on the Narrative Podcast by downloading this episode and all previously recorded of the episodes of the Narrative Podcast, sharing, liking, commenting, all that helps the algorithm. So like, you know, download it. The main thing is downloading my episodes, but then also pr- smashing that like button, um, leaving comments, wherever you get your podcast information from, you know, all that helps. But um, anyway, next article of the evening, headline reads, Black woman-owned company has raised salaries for black professionals by $150 million in four years. And the sister's name is Centonia. Tony, C-Y-N-T-O-N-I, Miller, CEO of Black on the Job, um, established in 2016. Uh, The company has raised salaries for black professionals by $150 million, um, got over $100,000, businesses uh, started. Um, The Facebook group is full of free career resources and real-time expert insights into uh, workplace dynamics of black people. So like the statistics, you know, what industries are paying the most, how to get training to get into those in- industries that's paying like a lot of money, where to get the resources to do it. And then, you know, as anything in life, um, you got to pay to play. So if you want to get in on the front row to these um, industries, they got, you know, that website has a, a communities you can join. Um, It's loaded with uh, webinars that you can uh, purchase and, you know, get the certification you need need to get to get into a a high paying field. Um, She's been transforming, uh, you know, working in uh, working class and, uh, you know, upper middle class people into, you know, six-figure earners. So if you're trying to get into the six-figure crowd, this might be for you. Not saying like having a million dollars, like, you know, everybody thinks, you know, when you get a million dollars, your problem's just automatically over. But when you get to that threshold, that's when your problems are actually starting. But I'm just saying like, if you're trying to cross over and get to that, you know, double, double uh, decimal, double comma world, then, you know, that's for you. Um, The mission statement is to close the wealth gap by providing low-cost career services, specially tailored towards moving black people into six-figure roles. Uh, For more information, um, go to uh, blackonthejob.co, not com, dot co, um, telephone number, you can call them at 1-657-233-2685 or message them directly at heyb at jobbyacademy.org and that's h-e-y-b-e-e at job, j-o-b, B E E Academy dot org. And I spelled it all out because I didn't I want you to get it right if you're really interested in it to participate. I'ma definitely I'm at least like, you know, go to the site and look at the free stuff and I'm gonna ask some questions at some point. I might even like, you know, 
revisit this at a later time with more information, share this back, because this could be a very powerful resource. So yeah, this is definitely worth, you know, investigating and doing your due diligence. Um, like, what do you got to lose? Seriously, um, go check this sister out. Um, she's a CEO of Black On The Job. I think they even got an app in the App Store, in the Apple Store. So, you know, go check it out. Black On The Job, CEO, Centoya Miller. Let's, um, you know, join me in the giving that sister a warm narrative podcast. Round of applause for Black On The Job. Job. Uh, it seems like I'm missing a one. Oh, it was. <laughs> like I said, I got a whole lot tonight. I miscounted y'all. I got a couple more. All right, this next one. Headline reads, how Atlanta stylist Reese DeForest Transform Madam C.J. Walker's historic saloon into a museum. Um, so here's the physical address. It's 54 Hillard Street, Northeast Atlanta, Georgia, 30312. Um, It's located in the Auburn, Auburn Avenue Historical District. Um, it didn't say what year he stumbled onto it, but the place had been around since the uh, 40s. Um, please don't make me tell you who Madam C.J. Walker was. You should just know that by now. Like, if you don't, and it's Black History Month, you don't know who Madam C.J. Walker is, shame on you. But I'm gonna put you out of your misery. Um, Madam C.J. Walker was the first ever black millionaire. She was like the first sister to acquire, to earn a million dollars in America anyway. But um, so that was, you know, her historic uh, boutique, which also doubles as a, a museum. It had a lot of memorabilia. It was also, at one point in the time, um, a radio station called Word, W-E-R-D Studio. And Word, or W-E-R-D, was the very first all black radio station in America. Not had played black music, but this is the whole format was black. Producers, engineers, music, it was top executives, board of directors, all that, all, when I say black, I mean all black. It was America's first all black radio station. And um, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, um, had his own um, radio show on WERD, and you know, he helped organize a whole lot of uh, civil rights functions uh, via the WERD airwaves. So that's like a double honor. Um, so we see before us, um, he's a well known stylist in Hollywood. He styled a whole lot of, um, you know, pretty much every single 
celebrity in Hollywood from our community from the 60s, the late 50s, all the way up until now. So, you know, I mean, he did the admirable thing, but rather, you know, he's a stylist, so, you know, saying it without saying it. But anyway, his heart's in the right place. Um, he snatched up that uh, piece of land, went through the process of getting it uh, recognized as a national, as a historical monument, and um, it's open to this day. Like I said, the article didn't tell like what year he purchased the property and how he got the means to purchase the property, but you know that's definitely positive. We need to preserve um, our past because you know the powers that be is always trying to rewrite our past. And as the old saying goes, if you don't tell your own story, your own story will be told for you. So congratulations and salute to this brother for preserving our rich history, our story. Um, so if you're ever in Atlanta, Georgia, at any time of year that it's open, I behoove you to plead, I mean, it would behoove you to check out that really rich part of our past, you know? So join me into giving Brother Reese DeForest a warm narrative podcast round of applause for the uh, Madam C.J. Walker Boutique in Atlanta, Georgia. I believe this is my last article for this evening. And then after this, I got a couple of black history facts for you and then some um, commentary, some things I want to talk about. But um, here we go, last article of the evening. The headline reads, Two Black Women Founders by Historic Building in Downtown Pittsburgh. Um, the sisters' names are Camille Bailey and Samantha Black, and they are the founders and CEOs and founders of Greenwood Place. And Greenwood Place is a nonprofit organization. Um, the Greenwood um, excuse me, I'm saying Greenwood Place is Greenwood Plan. The uh, Greenwood Plan is a, a nonprofit organization slash incentive um, with the initiative to acquire downtown Pittsburgh for a million dollars or four million dollars, excuse me. It will be it will serve as a, a headquarters to create creators and um, professionals. Um, the Greenwood was named after Tulsa's Black Wall Street. Uh, they finalized the acquisition in December of last year of 23. Um, if you want to know more about the Greenwood plan, you can uh, email them directly at info at Greenwood greenwoodplan.com or go to the greenwoodplan.com um, let's give it up for our sisters Camille and Samantha and the Greenwood Plan
So next section, I got is black history facts section. I got two of them for you. And of course, the reason why I'm doing black history facts because it's black history month. Which is crazy, like we ain't even gonna get into, you know, February being the shortest month of the year, they, whatever, but, you know, here on the Narrative Podcast, the last uh, week of Black History Month is next week. I have two Black History facts for you this weekend, which would be the first, or the second, or what, what is it, 29? Can I count? <laughs> Okay, so today is the 29th, which is Thursday. Friday is the first. Saturday is the second. So, yeah. So, I have a, a black history facts for you on, uh, this weekend on the second. And then, um, if I'm on air during the following week, I have some more for you. But anyway. <clears throat> Without any further ado, uh, Black History Facts for this week here on the Narrative Podcast. I'm going to be talking to you about the life and times of a brother named John Morton Finney. So, John Morton Finney earned um, over a hundred, over uh, ten degrees, and practiced law all the way up until he was 100 years old. Uh, So he's the longest practicing attorney in United States history. Um, He was born in 1889. He served in the military in 1914. Um, He earned his first college degree in 1916 from Lincoln College in Jefferson City, Missouri. Married a woman named um, Pauline Ray while in Missouri. Uh, He later went on, at some point, moved to uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, where he taught at the Crispus Attucks High School in Indianapolis, Indiana. Please don't make me tell you who Crispus Attucks is, y'all. For real, I got to tell y'all who Crispus Attucks was. Crispus Attucks, he fought and uh, was killed, uh, unalived in the Revolutionary War for to establish this country. So, you know, I'm not going to go any deeper into his past and all, you know, what he did. But uh, anyway, our brother taught at a school named after Crispus Attucks. Um, he continued his education while uh, working at Crispus Attucks High School. Um, he was uh, awarded the Dean of Foreign Languages for 47 years at Crispus Attucks um, High School. Um, he continued his education while working full time at the high school. He earned a PhD in education from Indiana U, later pursued law and earned five degrees in the area, including a, a degree from Lincoln College in 1933, one from uh, or, uh, J.D. from Indiana in 1946 at 57, passed the bar, but before it ended, he passed the bar in 1935, earned his last degree of his uh, career at 75, from Butler University. <clears throat> so I'm just, I gave you the condensed version. There was like way more than that. If I would have uh, listed every single degree that brother got, like 
you know, it would have been like eight, nine pages. Like I hand write these little notes. When you hear me shuffling paper, that's me trying to get it right on my bulleted notes for the information that I'm sharing with you. But it would have been like five or six pages if I would have listed every single degree and accolade that brother had. But trust me, it was over 10 and, you know, he, he practiced law all the way up until 100 years old. So let's give a warm narrative podcast round of applause for our brother John Morton Finney, Norton Finney. Yeah, it's um, John Morton Finney. I've been saying Norton. <laughs> slip of the tongue, y'all. Slip of the tongue. Morton Finney. Uh, All right, next black history fact before diving into our current events this evening. Um, this is about the life and times of Mary Lumpkin. Okay. And Mary Lumpkin was um, a formerly enslaved woman who liberated a slave jail and transformed it into America's first HBCU. Um, she was born in 1832 and historical uh, notes describe her as nearly white, which one can deduce she was either an octoroon or a quadroon. Um, She was sold to a Caucasian man by the name of Robert Lumpkin. Um, so that's hence her last name, Lumpkin. Um, the, Robert was uh, nearly 30 years old. He was like 28, 29. She was only um, 12. Um, and basically, you know, he had his way with her and forced her to uh, bear his children. Um, and she basically told him, you can do whatever you want to do to me, but I want would like for my children to, you know, be born free. And so for her impulence, she got tossed in the hoose cow. Um, they arrested her from 1844, she was in jail from 1844 to 1846. Uh, while incarcerated, um, she educated herself, taught herself how to read. Um, upon, um, you know, her release from jail, um, the jail was, like, back up a bit, the jail was referred to as the Devil's um, Acre. So, Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I lost myself in my notes. <laughs> okay, trying to find my place. Um, okay, so like I already said, she was locked up from 1844 to uh, 1846. Um, taught herself how to read. Um, 
So after her release from jail, she uh, moved to Pennsylvania just right before the Civil War um, with her uh, slave master's approval, of course. She had to ask for his uh, permission to be let free. And I'm assuming he let her go because, you know, she could, he couldn't do nothing with her. She was too old by the time, you know, she got out of jail. So, you know, it wasn't worth nothing to him anymore as a slave. And, you know, granted her permission, but, uh, you know, he passed away shortly after her release from jail. And um, she left, he left the um, whole, you know, everything in that area to her the jail and um, everything surrounding the jail. So she inherited that place in like um, 1866 uh, and turned it into uh, God's half acre. You know, it was originally known as the devil's half acre. Um, she renamed it God's half acre, uh, Virginia University. So, yeah, that was the first um, black HBCU in this country. And um, and it was authentically, it was probably the only actual legit black HBCU, meaning all the other HBCUs in the country are named uh, directly after the slave masters, like every single one of them, Howard, Morehouse, they're all named after slave master. That one was named after, you know, the state basically, the state of Virginia. Or the slang word referred to as the jail, whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, so that's some interesting things. And like I said, I gave you guys a streamlined version because the story is so much more complex. But to, uh, you know, to fit it for my uh, time frame, I had to like condense it down and just give you the highlights of her past. But anyway, I provided some nuggets. Um, you know, we've come along, we've come, come so far from that. But uh, let us never forget that. Let us never forget the contributions of our brother, John Morton Finney, and our sister, Mary Lumpkin. All right, so all done with the articles this evening. Going to dive right on into the speaking points. I got some things I want to discuss this evening. Um, First of all, I think I did leave out one section here in the narrative podcast um, as far as like, you know, just a misnomer I think you need to know about. Um, this is a positive space. Um, I don't promote, endorse, engage in uh, um, gossip or slander or negativity. Um, I don't, you know, try to encourage gossip and um, defaming another brother or a sister's name. Um, I try to encourage or discourage my um, listening audience to do that because I think gossip and slander is what's tearing us apart as a community. Um, the powers that be has made that profitable. You know, they've incentivized it. They incentivize us turning on each other online, um, airing out our dirty laundry. Um, we're not the only people that do it, that take the bait, but we're just the only people who, you know, get exploited for doing it. Like the camera's like right there when we do it. Every, you never ever see nobody else's messiness online. You only see our messiness online. 
and we get messy with each other and air out the dirty laundry. You don't never ever see people in the um, Italian community when they're getting messy with each other online. You never see the back and forth interaction between them. You never see the back and forth, inter the negative back and forth interaction with people that don't get along so great in the Asian community. Um, you know, in the Irish community and so on, Italian, so on and so forth, you know, but when we air out our grievances with each other in a public setting, it's like a, a media blitz, it's a media frenzy. It's just, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks and the machine just keeps putting money behind it and keeps um, milking it and milking it until, you know, the story finally tanks and tell whoever it's about finally say, okay, I'm over it, whatever. Um, you know, so here on Narrative Podcast, I definitely don't wanna, um, you know, gossip and slander. And if I bring up a famous person's name, it's basically to illustrate a point that I'm making all the, uh, all my commentary that I do on this um, podcast, I'm delivering it from the perspective, from the why perspective. Because everybody, including us, we all will, you know, want us to take accountability for the uh, foul, wrong things we do to each other and to other people. But nobody wants to acknowledge why do we act like that? And we act like that because we've been programmed and conditioned to behave that way. So if I bring up a famous person's name, it's really just to illustrate a point that I'm making, especially when, you know, during my current events commentary, it's never to uh, bash them, berate them, or tear them down. Um, what I do do, however, however, I will tell the truth about a famous person if they're irresponsibly utilizing their platform, their public domain, if they have a, a pol polarizing platform, but they're making, you know, irresponsible gestures or saying just irresponsible things on their platform or allowing irresponsible things that transpire on their uh, platform and it affects us as a people as a whole because people equate us, you know, when they look at that person, you know, it's like that person's representing the entire community. Um, I will say something about that, but um, it's never to uh, shame, denigrate, finger point or none of that, but I got to tell the truth. So other than telling the truth, I don't talk bad about nobody. I don't, you know, I don't call nobody a Sambo, a, um, a coon or nothing like that on my platform and encourage other people not to, to do the same. All right, so now that you know about all the misnomers for my commentary. Let's dive on into the commentary. Um, for this evening, um, first order of business. So yeah, uh, lawmakers, um, been saying it and I've 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 been saying it, but at least I think I got to say it again. You better start stocking up on all your non-perishable food items, uh, start stockpiling your water, start stockpiling your toilet paper, because we just had averted um, another, you know, government shutdown. And so basically what they're arguing on Capitol Hill we know the, uh, it's tax season, the fiscal quarter. During the fiscal quarter, it's like, you know, all these Fortune 500 companies and, um, you know, uh, uh, governments, 
like local governments and up on Capitol Hill and all these Fortune 500 companies, they got what's called a SARS report. And what that is is just basically like um, an expense report. Like what, what are you spending money on? And usually this is where if you're spending too much on one thing, you know, they start trimming the fat. They start getting rid of the departments they don't need or they feel they don't need. Um, start downsizing departments, start um, getting rid of programs that they feel aren't beneficial to, you know, certain whatever, you know, for that business, if it's a business, in terms of government, you know, for the community. And it's usually why we need to pay attention and worry about it is because when they do that on the government side of it, when they start trimming the fat, it's they usually start getting rid of and alleviating uh, the very few programs out there that are helping our people, they start getting rid of them. So like right now on Capitol Hill, they're deadlocked, they're arguing over uh, funds. And the majority of the funds that they're arguing about is, you know, you know, foreign aid, um, all this stuff that we're giving to, you know, the immigrants, the migrants, um, as well as um, stuff right here in America that's helping not just our community, but just the American people in general. And, you know, they're getting deadlocked on the issues. And they say if they come to another deadlock, this was just this week, if they get, get deadlocked again, then it, it could be a possible government shutdown. Now, why is a looming government shut down the whole thing. As we know, we got election time coming up because the past always repeats itself. Sometimes it takes the past hundreds or thousands of years to repeat itself. Sometimes it, the past repeats itself every five to 10 years, every 20 to 30 years. But like we just seen this pattern when the thing first hit us. So they're talking about they was having these many government shutdowns. They was already talking about shutting down for a day during the elections, you know, last term. And then all these different um, illnesses being um, created and experimented on. They're cranking out dozens of those every other week. So, you know, it's about to get real, real choppy, man. It's about to get real super choppy. Um, so, best bet is just to armor up. I could go into depth and tell you all the names of all the legislators and who's the ones threatening, you know, trying to, you know, push for the lockdown or the government, excuse me, the government shutdown. So if the government shutdown comes, you know, the lockdown's coming too with that. But I'm not going to go into all the specific names because it doesn't really do us any good as the listening audience to know. But um, you can... You know, we're all smart here. You can do your Googles and see what I'm talking about. Um, it just, it's not even a whole week old. It was just like last week they was talking about a full, you know, government shutdown. <clears throat> all right. So, next order of business coming right down in our neighborhood, the young brother. Uh, turning up a notch, another notch. It seems like he's going to kind of be a thing. This is my third time I'm talking about this young brother because it's the third time um, he came across my timeline. Um, the young brother, uh, Daryl George. And if you don't know who Daryl George is, do your research. It's a young man out in Texas. He was at a high school and he got suspended for most of the school year due to his hairstyle. 
It said his hairstyle, which is locks, violate the uh, school's dress code. It said um, no student is to have male or female or the males can't have hair past their earlobe or touching the collar of their shirt. And so our brother got locks, but the thing about his locks, he got his locks braided up into like a crown. You see, and it's ironic that he has his locks braided up into a crown because there is a piece of legislation in Texas called the Crown Act. And the Crown Act prohibits businesses and institutions from discriminating against people with ethnic hairstyle, i.e. our people. And within the Crown Act, it covers locks, it covers headdresses, bantu wraps. Like we live in, in, you know, once upon a time in corporate America, some stuff that wouldn't fly. They're now letting um, people that work in uh, corporate America, especially like uh, Middle Eastern descent, especially in the Islam Isl Islamic world, you know, they're letting them uh, have big, giant, long beards, you know, in corporate America, not having to uh, shave their beards, their, their Islamic beards. They're now allowed to wear turbans in the uh, boardroom, uh, allowed to wear kufis. Um, you know, in the women, they're allowed to wear the jihabs. And, um, you know, extensions and weaves and all that, that's acceptable now in corporate America. In corporate America, this is dollars and cents. And I said all that to say, because what is school? School, high school is supposed to be like a microcosm of corporate America. They're supposed to be um, teaching you or assimilating you for, you know, the future, which is corporate America, which is college, you know, high school, college, the real world. That's what they're trying to, um, you know, teach you in high school. That's what high school is supposed to be about, to teach you about the real world, how the real world works. Well, now in the real world, hair is no longer an obstacle to obtain employment. So if it's no longer an obstacle on the outside world, you know, why is that a distraction in high school? Because, like, high school ain't even super serious. You, look, you, you look, use less than an eighth of what you learn in high school anyway after you go to college. You basically have to unlearn everything you learned in high school when you get to college. Because, like, let's be real, because, like, when you get to, like, 10th or 11th, it's all packet work and um, multiple choice questions anyway. The teachers kind of stopped caring on senior year. Like, you know, they're not forcing the children to think critically or do anything that mirrors the real world anymore. You don't get no timeouts. You don't get no uh, free mental health day. So why was they so disturbed by this young man's um, hairstyle? But um, anyway, I'm just bringing people that's unfamiliar that are unfamiliar with the ch with um, Daryl George um, scenario. Um, yeah, so they uh, just recently uh, ruled, the court system just recently uh, ruled that the Crown Act didn't specify length. So they're saying the Crown Act isn't ap applicable with the, uh, the school um, dress code policy. But again, his locks were up 
his locks aren't touching his, you know, his collar. His lock, locks don't go past the nape of his neck. It's done up into a crown. So I shudder to think if the young man would have wore an afro, would have wore a natural, would he have still got suspended? Would he still be in violation of the school policy if he had wore an afro? No, what they're doing to this young man is something called butt breaking. They're trying to make a public example out of him. Back in slave times, they used to call, you know, they call, used to call it butt breaking when they would single out um, a masculine black man, the most masculine black man on the plantation, whip him into submission, like literally whip him into submission. Um, in some instances, sodomize him in public so the overseers could assert their dominance over him after they would sodomize the um, strong black buck. He would, he's no more. He's a shell of his former self. He's not rebelling anymore. And so, you know, that's what they're doing. That's a modern day version of buck breaking that they're attempting to do with this young man who is now 18. He was 17. He just turned 17 when the whole debacle took place. Like, he just turned 17 before the school year started. And then, like, mid-school year, you know, they decided, the first they did the end of school suspension and said, if you don't cut him, you're out of here. So they didn't want to expel him, but he can't attend regular classes. He has to be in school, in in-school suspension to, to graduate. Like he's almost done anyway, so at this point he don't care. It's just the principal, um, as I say in the hip-hop community, he's standing on business. That's why he hasn't cut his locks off. His mother, um, you know, told him he better not cut his locks. So he's, that's, that's the option for him to be in, in regular classes with, you know, all the other children. He has to cut them. They can't be done up into the crown, no other hairstyle. He can't have locks, period, is what they're saying. He can't have locks, period. Um, but that's just what's happening in general. But this new news concerning a brother is a local activist by the name of Candace Math Matthews. Pardon me, put some respect on the sister's name. Dr. Candace Matthews. Um, this sister is, you know, a native of Texas and she wears um, a cowboy hat. You know, she's, uh, if you know, the origin of the cowboy. We was the original cowboys. Maybe that'd be a, you know, my next black history fact. But um, her signature look is a cowboy hat, and she got a cowboy John Wayne techno-ish type attitude. She's a, a local activist, and every time something happens in Texas, um, she's right there on the spot. It's either her or uh, Brother Cornell X, right there on the spot, demonstrating in the soil in Texas. Um, she basically confronted the whole uh, faculty in regards to this matter. She caught some teachers coming outside, and she, she pulled up, as I said, in the um, hip hip hop community, I'm gonna pull up. She pulled up on him. And she had, you know, gotten in her face and told him, y'all gonna leave this young man alone. Y'all gonna stop messing with him. He's sitting up there manipulating policy. And she basically read them the riot act and um, told them their time was up. And basically like she's gonna make their lives a living hell. And I believe she's gonna make good on her promise. And I promise you, when she's done, they ain't going to do it to another one. But, 
you know, that's just the latest development of this story. Um, they already said his hair, you know, on the legal side of it. On the, um, they're trying to get another trial, you know, to, you know, appeal that ruling. Uh, but yes, racially biased, of course. Um, it's definitely a shot to our, uh, his racial identity. Because our hairstyle, our people, original people, our hairstyle, hairstyles, being original men and women of this planet, you know, our hairstyle is a direct connection to nature. If you look at anything in nature, it resembles our hairstyle. You can look at trees, the tree branches, with and without the leaves, we got a hairstyle that looks like that. Um, so yeah, we definitely have, um, a hairstyle that resembles something in nature. Um, but, um, anyway, that's all I really want to touch on for that, um, um, particular subject, that sister is um, doing her job. She's on the job. She's in the soil. Um, she's passionate about it. She's not effing around, and she's not the one to eff around with. Um, go check her on her track rec her, on her track record and pull her resume up. Um, every time something happens within our community in that section of the world, she's right there on the spot. Um, so my next subject that I wanted to touch on was the passing of our brother, um, Flint Council Member Eric Mays, and, um, just, like, people don't realize how great he was and how positive of a role model he was when he was alive. Um, people saw him on, um, you know, social media. He's Mr. Point of Order, Mr. Information. Now, if you know anything about government, when you're in meetings like that, when they say point of order, point of information, something's going on, there's some misconduct, they're trying to get control over the meeting again. And so, you know anything about Eric Mays, he's always calling for the point of order or a point of information because someone would be basically complaining about his conduct, but he was trying to keep, you know, the meeting from derailing. They was basically talking to him, insulting his intelligence. Um, again, I got to point out the, uh, I got to point out the miscommunication. Um, not about miscommunication, but the way uh, the media warps and twists the narrative. They try to portray him like he was, you know, he was starting uh, problems. They're always showing him as the aggressor, as the troublemaker, when in reality, um, he was trying to uh, bring about order to the meetings. And he was trying to get, they have, when 
you know, these uh, city council meetings, you see all of them where they sit down, they got a, a, an itinerary. They got a whole list of things they're supposed to talk about and vote on in a certain amount of time. And at these council meetings with uh, people, these greedy, lazy people that we vote in the office, a lot of them, they legit get paid for doing nothing. They'll do anything to prolong a meeting. The longer they're there, the more money they get paid. These people, these council members, they get free food on the city. They get free lodging. If they need it, like a hotel room, they put that you know, on their expense account. They get free food, they get free transportation. Like, and we're all citizens, you know, footing the bill. And so our brother wasn't having it. Cause they were sitting up there trying to basically, um, I think in the taxi world, if, you know, back in the, before Uber and Lyft, taxi cabs, they would have what was called milking the meter. When they just detour and take the super long route to get from point A to point B, to make you pay more money as a passenger. And so, you know, when he would spaz out on these people, on these other elected officials, it's because they was trying to milk the meter. They was trying to make the meeting go longer than what it was supposed to go as. And the whole time they were sitting up there trying to insult his intelligence. Um, the man was a, a political science major he was pretty much older than everybody on the council, so he knows the rules of the council. He knows when he got permission to speak, when he doesn't have permission to speak, um, letting people who don't have anything to do come up into the um, meeting, disrupting the meeting. Um, we saw he, him almost get assaulted several times, you know, in these old um, clips of Eric Mays. Um, but basically, you know, that was a form of buck breaking. Um, because he was a masculine brother that wasn't taking no BS. He was standing on his principles and he wasn't having the nonsense that was sitting up there trying to milk the meter. And we as a people, or the people that over there in Flint, they should have been thanking and applauding Eric Mays for talking to them people like that. Because, you know, they was taking money out of y'all's pocket by sitting up there, um, letting all that buffoonery and shenanigans go down at them council meetings instead of staying on task and talking about what they were supposed to be talking about. They were sitting up there letting people off the street just go up in there, no appointment, disrupt the meeting, threaten people and everything. So yeah, that's what I want to talk about for our brother um, Eric Mays. You know, good brother, masculine brother, stood on business, stood on principle, wasn't taking no mess from nobody, um, he wasn't having none of it. And I don't think we're gonna get another Eric Mays because what we got now is a whole lot of bootlickers representing us up in these, uh, you know, town hall meetings. People afraid to speak up for our people, just um, going along with the agenda and not saying nothing. All right, and last thing we're gonna talk about, um, or I'm gonna talk about before I let you guys go this evening, is um, Diddy's accusers. Diddy's new accusers. Now, for those who, have, who hasn't um, been following the latest news, it all started when a, with an artist whom 
he had a, a romantic relationship with a young lady by the name of Cassie, who was an artist, R&B singer. She alleged, you know, sexual misconduct of Diddy and, you know, said her, you know, he made her do some deplorable things, engage in some deplorable acts, and, um, you know, took him to court, and he settled out immediately. And then right when you know, right after he settled, the avalanche came. Now everybody in the industry, all of a sudden now, got a Diddy story, a I survived Diddy story. Diddy touched me, or I witnessed Diddy um, freaking off. Um, F and O, I don't know how that's gonna set the uh, algorithm. They witnessed uh, Diddy F and O in me. Like, and I know trauma doesn't have an expiration date. If you did something disgusting like that, you know, those emotional scars, people are gonna wear those emotional scars for the rest of their life if you used your power and influence to, you know, coerce somebody into letting you have your way with it. And like I said, if he did do those foul things that everybody's alleging, um, it's disgusting, it's deplorable, and, you know, he needs to be punished. But at the same time, how come they're trying to make him seem like he's the biggest, nastiest, weirdest, highly weird perv that ever perved in Hollywood? When you got people like Harvey Weinstein, when you had people like uh, Woody Allen that been effing Owen off for years, when uh, rest his soul, um, Hugh Hefner, but he's the worst, Diddy's the worst out of all them weird, nasty, freaky people in Hollywood, he's the worst. I think it's really hypocritical people's stance now because it's like, you know, it's giving me R. Kelly vibes. Like for years we've been sitting up there watching Diddy. Don't know man that doesn't harbor tendencies, lick his damn lips that much. You talking all soft, hey playboy, hey. You, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the trail of breadcrumbs was in front of our face all these years, but for whatever reason, we turned a blind eye to it. Like, okay, well, that's his business. Oh, well. But now all of a sudden, that money is on the table. Now, now everybody wants to take a moral stance. Now that Cassie got her settlement, now everybody, I have to speak up because if I don't speak up, it's going to just keep on continuing to happen. It's going to keep on, you know, um, corrupting, pe using his power to corrupt people and take advantage of people and hurt people. Like, we've been seeing it. We've all been, like, you know, from fans to other artists, we've all been complicit in it. We've been witnessing this guy do these things since, you know, the 90s, since 94. Like, he was a CEO. I mean, like, he was an intern in the early 90s, like, late 80s, early 90s. So, like, right after he made his first million, we've been witnessing his sus-like behavior. Like, when he was on Drink Champs, you know, that really, how uncomfortable Nori was and Jada, like, he been doing that since the 90s. He been like acting like that. All these little pictures are now surfacing. You know, he used to go to parties and take off his pants. But now it's just, he's super weird now. Now, in 
2024. He's been doing it since the 90s, since 91. Now he's just the biggest, weirdest, nastiest perv that ever perv. The problem actually didn't start happening until Diddy was about to, you know, acquire the rights for, for uh, you know, a multi-million dollar streaming network and try to reclaim BET for our people, try to get BET back from Viacom. That's when all the, these problems and allegations came out. And like I said, I'm not talking bad about the brother. Um, if he did all those vile, disgusting things, he needs help and he needs to be punished and he definitely needs to atone for all those filthy, nasty, vile things that he did to people, if, if, if any of it's true. But at the same time, don't punish him more harshly. Don't try to make an example out of him. Because why do we always got to be the example? Why, when it comes to dishing out punishment, we have to be the bar? Why couldn't you have the bar with Harvey Weinstein? Why did he got to be the example? We're not going to take it anymore. Anybody that uses their position like that needs to be punished. He's going to spend the rest of his life behind bars for everything he did to all those people. Now everybody's just like on their John Wayne. And we've been witnessing and observing this guy act like that for all these years and ain't nobody said nothing. Like, people is just, like, really coming across super hypocritical now. I don't feel a, a, a sorry for these new accusers, because these new accusers, like, um, like, these dudes is, like, cock diesel gym trainers talking about Diddy did something to him. You, dude, bruh, you, like, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, you let this man touch your wee-wee? That's you. That's you not standing on your principles and not standing on your morals. If you're going to sit up there and let somebody violate you. This is how sick we done got as a society. We'll literally do and subject ourselves to any type of treatment for some money. I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for myself. I live homeless on the street, eating out of a garbage can or whatever, hustling tin cans before I let another man violate me over a job. That's a job I don't need. I don't want it. If you want to stick something back, if you want to try to enter my exit hole, if you want to touch my uh, lower parts, I don't need that job. But y'all didn't. Y'all said, yeah. Y'all said, okay. And now you're going to scream he violated you when you let him do it. Now I got a little softer spot for the sisters that's claiming, you know, he violated. Because women, you know, it's harder for a woman because there's more factors that come into play. Because he could have been using his power and influence, extorting, and I'm going to expose, I'm going to leak these pictures out if you don't do it. I'm going to tell this person if you don't do it. Um, you're not going to, you want to be a model, you won't be a model unless you do it. So it is harder for a woman to say no than it is for a man to say no. If you a man and you let that dude violate you, allow him to violate you. You know, you made that conscious choice. Because you could have said no. You could have said hell no.
But yeah, just people is really coming across super hip, duper hypocritical to me these days. Um, you know, with all these Diddy accusations, and again, I'm not caping for the man. Um, I'm not trying to make excuses for him if he did do, do those horrible, wicked, vile things, those disgusting, filthy, nasty things. If he, you know, if one account is remotely true, he's foul for that. But at the same time, it's like everybody coming out the woodwork basically stomping him while he's down. And we do that a lot to each other. We kick each other while we're down. Like no other group of people does that to, to themselves. You ain't never seen nobody in the Jewish community kick another Jewish person when they're down. You ain't never seen nobody in the Asian community kick another Asian person when they're down. You ain't never seen a person in the Italian community kick another Italian co uh, why an Italian person was down. Ain't never seen nobody in the Irish community kick another Irish person why an Irish person was down. Like, but in our community, when we fall, like everybody rushes to stomp you out. To pass judgment, talk about you, drag you all up and down. But then when you go, after you get through your hard time and pivot, then, oh, I never thought you was like that. I always was within the da da da. Like, nah, you stomping people out while they down. So that's my take on it. We need to, um, if you're not going to help the brother, provide resources where he can get some help if he did do it. If you do talk to him all like that and know him personally and ain't trying to pray for him or get him some help for his little problem, then you don't need to be on social media uh, platforms stomping them and kicking them while he's down. Because he has, at the end of the day, whatever you're talking about, what, you know, sexuality aside, um, preferences aside, whatever his lifestyle is, put that to the side and look at his track record for helping people. Now, a whole lot of people, a whole lot of artists said he stole from them. He done gave all his artists his, they published him back. Gave it to him. Gave it to him back. Um, anytime anything bad happened in our community and he knows about it, like a death, especially like a police brutality death, like if the police unalived somebody out of our community and did he know, know, know about it, He's footing the bill. The family ain't got to pay nothing for that whole year. Who's doing that in our community? How many people's doing that in our community? Um, putting people on with his connections as an entertainer. He started the Making the Band series. That was the first all-black reality television show, and it dominated the airway. It kicked every other reality shows, but it was bigger than the real world. It was bigger than everything out. He created that platform. He created that platform. He created the uh, revolt. We all like the Breakfast Club, no matter what, what's going happening with it now. Would it be a Breakfast Club if, if there was no Diddy? No, we just kicking them while he's down. And again, like I said, I ain't making excuses for the man. I ain't trying to uh, rationalize it and none of that. I'm just saying, like, you know, we need, as a people, we need to keep a united front sometimes. Because <clears throat> we all got that creepy, weird family member, but that is still our family. We know the, um, the rumors that we heard about that person is true. But they're still our family, right? And you ain't gonna let nobody else talk about your family. Y'all, you might talk about your family, the creepy weird one. You might pull them off him or her off to the side and beat the brakes off of them for that creepy weird stuff they be doing. But you ain't gonna let nobody else do it. 
So why can't we adapt that same mentality as a people? Why are we sitting up there letting everybody outside of our culture get their little jabs in and kick them wise down? Like we kicking them wise down, they following our example. So that's all I got to say about that. Um, And I'm going to put a pin in it here. Uh, join me again this weekend for a full edition of the Narrative Podcast. Um, make sure you download this episode and our previously recorded episodes of the Narrative Podcast, wherever you get your podcast information from. Um, I broadcast two times a week, once during the weekday, once on the weekend. Um, you can um, hit me up or uh, excuse me, <laughs> yeah, once during the uh, weekday, once on the weekend. Uh, to, like the best way to catch me when I'm broadcasting during the weekday is to subscribe to my uh, YouTube channel. It's my viewer channel. It's not one just exclusively for the narrative podcast. It's just my personal viewing channel, but I'm Halsey Allen on YouTube. And you can uh, click this uh, subscribe button and notification all, and you'll be notified every single time I make a uh, um, upload because this um, platform that I'm on goes right to YouTube, and it go also goes right to X after I, I have an episode uploaded automatically if it appears anywhere on any other medium i have to manually do it but it all it automatically does youtube and um x so i'm Halsey allen on youtube and i'm Halsey allen on x formerly known as twitter and you know follow me on any of those two platforms and you will be constantly notified with my um most recent up-to-date broadcast, and you will never miss an episode of the Narrative Podcast if you follow me on um, YouTube or uh, X. And like I said, this platform, um, you know, during the weekdays, I would uh, uh, usually go live, but they uh, did away with the live feature. So now it's just already pre-recorded when it's shared back on the social. But um, yeah, um, so that's that. Um, also, go to Poetizer.com. They have a virtual bookstore. They have a virtual uh, bookstore on uh, Poetizer.com. I have written a book of poetry titled The Black Card. Um, the black card is just basically a 30 page book of poetry um, capturing our entire essence as a people, uh, fully encompassing our culture and all our nuances we have about our people and our culture. Um, it'll make a great travel book. It'll make a good coffee table read. Um, in essence, it's basically a survival card so, you know, everything you need to know about our people and in our, our people and our culture is captured in the black card. So it's a snapshot about our people and our culture. Um, you know, like I said, it's a, a survival path. So you need to go to uh, poetizer.com today and get your copy of the black card or get your black card revoked. Um, I also have a, a personal poetry blog um, on blogger.com, and the address is, or the, um, the name of the blog is called Hawes' Poetry Corner, and the address is www.mrhawes'blogs.com, um, and what that is is just a, a collection of my poetry that I spontaneously write. Um, I don't, you know, contemplate any any poem that's up there, I never contemplated on the title 
or the subject, but it's so intricate. Um, you would think that I like, um, you know, sat down and um, revised it and all that. No, it's just like really just, you know, I just started typing on either my device or on a um, desktop. You know, with all the poems posted on there is just um, complete, completely kinetic. Like, you know, just a um, expression of my, I guess, my innermost thoughts um, that I didn't know that was there. So, like, in my bio on uh, Hawes' Poetry Corner, I said, I don't write poetry. Um, God just beams it into my head. And so when you read them, you will find out why. Be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Because I, there's no way I could just come come up with that. Like, I... I literally thought about nothing. I literally like thought about no topics. Like all that was written on the spur of the moment. But um, go check out, you know, Hawes's Poetry Corner, and the way you uh, support my poetry blog is share the link to Hawes's Poetry Corner, which is www.mrhawesesblogs.com. <clears throat> or a poem featured on Hawes's Poetry Corner on all platforms, or like whatever platform you're active on, whether it's Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, X, whatever, you know, you, you post content on, um, share the link to Hawes's Poetry Corner or share a poem featured on Hawes's Poetry Corner on all platforms, as well as like it. Um, you can comment on my poems too. They got a comment section on my poems. You can leave me a little comment on there. Um, yeah, but definitely share the link and share poems featured on Hawes' Poetry Corner across all pl platforms. Now, for the visual ones like YouTube and um, TikTok and, and InShot and all that, you'll probably have to, um, like, shout out, you know, Hawes' Poetry Corner or, like, you know, a poem, the title of the poem that you liked on there. But um, other than that, you know, share the link or a poem featured on Hawes' Poetry Corner across all platforms. And the tagline for Hawes' Poetry Corner is Hawes' Poetry Corner, poetry with a passion, poetry for all occasions. And when you read one, you will find out just why. But um, yeah, as far as this episode of the Narrative Podcast, I'm officially done. Out of here, like last year. Um, Join me again this weekend for another full edition of the Narrative Podcast, wherever you use your podcast information from. Remember to download this episode and our previously recorded episodes of the Narrative Podcast, wherever you get your podcast information from. Um, also, click the little heart button on it. Uh, leave me a comment. Say something. Leave a comment. Listen to them. Like, share, listen. But definitely, definitely download. If you don't do nothing else, download. Um, all that, you know, do it as much and, as much and as many times as you can possibly do it. And the content will keep getting better. Join me again this weekend for another full edition of the Narrative Podcast. That's it and that's all. Peace, family, sending y'all love, light, healing, energy. Um, I'm Harzi Allen, and I'm changing the narrative one episode at a time. I'm asking you to join me on my quest to change the narrative by becoming, the, by becoming a narrator. And while I'm changing the narrative one episode at a time, you can help me change the narrative uh, one social media post at a time. Until next time, Harzi Allen and the Narrative Podcast signing off, and it's like that.